Before we get started, I'll just let everyone introduce themselves, um, and then we'll sort of dive right in. I'm Dusty Anderson. I work on our global services demand team for our identity and data management practice. Basically, I'm a pre-sales overlay, kind of on the forefront, working with customers to solve their real-world problems and help them plan, build, and run their strategies. Hi, my name is Ralph Martino. I'm a practice director in the uh, identity data management pr practice here at Optiv. And I run the data governance and protection space, uh, a little bit of security, a little bit of privacy, governance, protection, all that around data. Hey, I'm Janelle Schalk. I'm a practice director in our identity and data management practice. And I run an amazing team called Strategic Consulting, where we do uh, lots of strategy, planning, workshops, assessments, and helping figure out how to, how to do things and how to mature. Good morning, I'm Jerry Chapman. I'm a technical director in the identity and data management team. Uh, my responsibility is to help drive uh, solutions across the practice, things like zero trust and, and so forth. So this is one of, those, one of those things that's near and dear to my heart. I don't know how I follow any of that, but I'm Robert Block. I'm the executive services director at Optiv. Uh, I took that role a few months ago. I span across all of our service domains, but my backbone for the last two decades has been identity. And Janelle's photo is very intimidating. It's like staring right at me from the monitor in front of us up there. So yeah, it looks just like that, by the way. <laughs> All right, so uh, open-ended to the panel, feel free. Um, we'll try to leave 10 or 15 minutes or so towards the end. I only have about 48 questions, so buckle up. He's actually um, not kidding. <laughs> we'll leave a few minutes at the end there for you guys to ask questions if you like as well. So. Zero trust is, is quite a buzz term. Um, staying away from sort of the technical aspects of, of zero trust, what, what business drivers are bringing customers to us to talk about zero trust and wanting to implement zero trust from a framework perspective? Um, in my space, the way they're usually coming and communicating with us is, is start, certainly starting to get their hands around the data, right? Uh, working with the business to classify the data. Uh, working with the business to understand the flows and mapping. So for us, the very first step is that initial uh, interaction with the business, defining their, uh, what assets are important to them, uh, and then walking through movement and usage cases with them. And that's usually where we're first starting to talk about the zero trust conversation. Yeah, I would say for me, um, two routes. Either one, they just had a breach and they've hit the panic button and called Optiv to bring someone like me on site to help them figure out how to fix it. Or two, they're moving to the cloud and now they're starting to think, how do we define what that looks like from a security perspective? I think to add to that, we see a lot of tool optimization discussions. So we've made all of these incredible investments. We've bought everything. We have a lot of shelfware and uh, we don't really know how to make it all work and how, how can we really embrace kind of the micro segmentation aspect of zero trust and go from there. We see a lot of like PCI stuff, but where, where can we do it besides just the PCI realm? Before you answer, Jerry, I mean, you and I go way back in this space. Isn't zero trust just another way to define defense in depth? <laughs> I'm allowed to be a contrarian up here. I mean, well, especially if you're Jerry. <laughs> right? <clears throat> so, so zero trust versus depth, de defense in depth. Um, I, you can see similarities. I think you can certainly see similarities, but I'd be careful with that. Um, I think that. To, to really to dive into zero trust is, is really to, to determine um, where you're protecting things like data, where you're protecting things like the micro segmentation, where you're protecting your entire infrastructure, and not just infrastructure, uh, IoT, uh, mobility, all of it, right? Um, so I, I think it's a little bit deeper than that. And I think it has to include um, uh, the the entire organization and not just your technical teams that are or your security team that is just like oh I, I'm going to put more more boundaries around that uh, so it's much deeper than that I think about that it, it was about purchasing tech, purchasing technology we layered something else on we bought something else we layered something else on we kept buying technology and buying technology with zero trust I think it's about defining a security strategy and then going through your assets and inventory what technologies you have that meet your strategy. But we tend to do it the opposite way, the cool, shiny, blinky light, the new technology, the thing we like the most. So when I think about zero trust, it's, about, it's not about layering and layering different technologies on top of it. It's more about, I think, uh, 
defining a strategy for security, uh, looking at your assets as a whole, uh, what gaps you have, and then going forward, uh, minimizing the, some of the technology instead of purchasing and layering and purchasing and layering. But in fairness, Zero Trust was coined in 2010, it's 2019. Uh, it's only became more conversational, a little more mainstream in the last two or three years. So what, what prevented us from really getting there so conversationally till now? Well, I think a lot of it, um, Zero Trust is all about networking. And the conversation's definitely shifted from just protecting the perimeter of the network and really thinking about the identity piece of it and making sure that then, to his point, the layering piece, that everything's really working to a much more synergy. Uh, you've got synergy in your systems so that everything's working better together. And that goes back to that defense in depth. Rather than thinking of the perimeter and creating micro perimeters, really thinking about how you're, once they're in the network, how are you trusting those people in your network or should you be trusting your people even once they're on the network? Well, I, I, yeah. I, I was just gonna We're totally about to have an agree. argument now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry, I can, I can take her off. <laughs> it's happened before. Um, I, I totally agree, and I think it's just an evolution. So I, I think, you know, you started out with general firewalls and we were it's us versus them mentality and now it's a very much we don't really know once we get in we don't really know what's happening and so it's the it's taking it beyond just like layer layer two or layer three and bringing it up to the application layer and really understanding how our packets are flowing and then we can introduce things like behavioral analytics and and all of the different identity and data components into it so really actually getting into what are we doing inside of our ecosystem rather than just the idea of how can we protect at these different perimeters. So I think it's just an evolution over the last 20, 25 years, and that's why we came up with this idea now. We had to figure out how to actually do it and how to make all the different things work together and share that same message. Ralph said what yeah. she said. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's just like any other term we've heard, right? GDPR, CCPA, the industry has taken these terms and, make it, and made it marketing terms. So you're attacked with all this technology that says, I do zero trust, we do zero trust. And it's like, well, who does zero trust? What are my outcomes? And then it's hard to talk to the business about it because they've bought assets, they've bought technology, there's no ROI. So it's a, very, it's a challenging discussion. I think that's what's taking so much time is it's a new buzzword. The vendors are, are capturing that buzzword and, and putting it in their marketing material. Uh, and security's kind of trying to figure it out themselves. Uh, they're just embarking on some of their identity programs. They don't want to take on another big project. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why I think uh, that it hasn't been adopted to to date. And I think it's picking up due to the breaches and the activity, right? People are, mo are moving from firewalls and inside outside networks to the identity and the data. And that's the only two things worth protecting in an organization. And I'll just add to that. So one of the things, I'm gonna add another buzzword, you're gonna hate it, Robert, but here it comes. <laughs> identity centric security. Right, bringing the identity in the hey, middle. That's, that's of question all that. five. Shh. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> Uh, yeah, identity-centric security. I think uh, you're, you're getting a lot of things coming on. You got a lot of uh, identity products that are bringing out, you know, what they're doing, and you got the standards going out to all your other your, your technologies, your your SIMs, your UBAs, your you know, your, just your access management tools, where the identity becomes a big part of that. Um, with that coming along, I think that that helps some of the zero trust conversation, where you know the the technologist or the product vendors saying, oh yeah, yeah, we do we do zero trust because we're we're integrating with that tool. And that becomes their, their zero trust model as a as a whole. So I think that's that's a driver behind why now it's a lot more uh, prevalent than than it was ten years. So to that point, no single product, I believe anyway, can provide you everything you would need from a zero trust perspective. So all the products in your zero trust framework have to be integrated in some way. Is that linkage, that fabric between all identity? Is it the is it the data itself? Like. Ralph is shaking his head no and yes, and so Ralph needs a mic. Like data, it all start, you know, I, I think it's more of a data-centric security model versus identity, I think identity is a component. It's really about what are the assets. He owns the data governance practice, yeah. just. <laughs> little sided, just a tad <laughs> bit, okay, but it, for me it's all about the data. It's about where it lives, what are critical assets, how it moves, uh, how it provides value to the business, how it turns into a cost if it's breached, and somewhere in there, it's about who has access to the information. Somewhere in there, the identity plays into it. But to, to 
add to that, when we talk about the identity story, you know, I like we like to talk about the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data, and the, all the classification of that data, and making sure that you have appropriate controls. But that all ties back into exactly what zero trust is, right? Because you're trying to micro segment on what your data is, but you have to know who's accessing and what the what the different devices are, and that's where the identity side really comes into play on the identity centric security. So I think it's an identity and data centric security if we can if we can, we can compromise we can on they're, that. They're, they're going to fight in a bit. That, it's okay. You know, it's a, you make a really excellent points on that. Well, and I think this debate that's happening here is exactly what I struggle with when I meet with customers. I mean, I've talked to probably hundreds of customers this past year, and each one of them has a different perspective of what they think zero trust is. So when they call me and say, "Hey, I want you to come on site, whiteboard out some zero trust strategy." I have to ask them, what are, what are you thinking of when you say that term? Because sometimes it's, well, we just want to multi-factor everybody before we let them on our network. Well, that's not really a zero trust strategy. That's like a different kind of handshake to say hello, in my opinion, in, in, in cybersecurity. And so it, it's hard. I mean, everyone comes with a different perspective, but I think at the end, we all see the same goals in place that it has to be a multi-layered approach, then it's not just about the perimeter, it's not just about protecting assets, it's not just about protecting data, sorry Ralph, but it's also controlling those identities in your ecosystem and making sure that everyone has the right access at the right time and that you're taking it away if it's not necessary to hold on to after, t after a certain amount of time as well. So I think it, it's the full story and you can't leave data out, but you can't leave identity out of it either. So, okay, so if there's zero common definition to zero trust, <laughs> um, if there's... Yes, yeah, sorry, Gartner and Forster. <laughs> if it, you know, when, I, when you Google search it, and you can see that there's 15 vendors who talk about their ability to support zero trust. It's not business terminology, it's vendors and their functions and technology. If I'm a business owner at an at organization and I hear the word zero trust, there's zero chance I want to deploy that because that sounds like there's zero user experience relative to zero trust. Told you I'd get four or five zeros in, right? <laughs> doing Told it, you. doing it. Um, how do you explain it to the business? So talk to them, talk to me as if you were trying to help me as a business owner understand that zero trust is actually a good thing for me and my business side of what we do. How do I create that linkage between infrastructure and ops and, and the business side of our worlds? I don't say the word zero trust is how I start building up that strategy. It's what are you doing to protect your ne network? What are your, how is your infrastructure built? Are you on-prem? Are you cloud? Are you hybrid? And that begins the conversation of how you set it up. How are you protecting your identities today? How are you managing them? How are you governing the access? How are you protecting your data? Start asking those questions. And then leave the I, marketing term. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Throw that out the window. I don't talk technology. I don't talk solutions until I understand what the lay of the land is there and what their real challenges are. Because so many of them do read on the websites and get all sorts of buzzwords and terminology from different tool sets that they see that sound really bright and shiny. But what's it going to do for them and their system if they're on prem and they've been looking and reading about a cloud strategy? What's that going to do for them? So let me so, just add yeah. to Dusty. So Dusty, you're saying something very important. One thing that, that's not oh, been said, and I'm going to say this. said something very important. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> just one. <laughs> the one thing that I don't think is really being defined is, is zero trust is, is really a programmatic approach. You know, far too many vendors are coming in with a very tactical implementation. MFA is tactical. Uh, zero perimeter or micro segmentation, that's tactical. Data classification, that's tactical. You have to come through an entire process to really build a strategic approach to make this. And we're not talking a, a six, month, six month process. It's 18 months, right? 24 months. It's not a, a one, one and done deal, right? So to your point, uh, Dusty, it's um, it's easy, it starts start talking strategy, but then really setting expectations that, that zero trust is, is programmatic. And, and then really, you know, what is the CISO looking for, right? The CISO, whoever's calling you in, they want to stop breaches. They want to keep their job, right? That's, that's what they want. So these tactical things sometimes is what they're looking for, but the real approach is the, the programmatic 18, 24 months down the road to get you where you need to be. Yeah, I think it's defining that strategy. I would never go in to talk to the business and say we're implementing zero trust, right? It's building out my security strategy, it should be focused on protecting the digital assets that are important to them. 
So making sure that we understand that and involving them with classification items, involving them with how they use data, and, and just start getting them uh, involved more with the processes and with their assets. And it just should start evolving. But it starts with that security strategy and the very basics of making them aware that they have assets, whether it's regular regulatory asset or intellectual property. They need to start you know, managing it themselves. So bring them into the fold lightly before I start giving them buzzwords that we're going to solve for GDPR, we're going to solve for zero trust. And things like that. I think all of that is, is absolutely spot on. However, we often have CIOs or CISOs that are extremely excited about the new thing that they learned at their different conferences or the thing that their buddies, when they're playing golf, you know, talk about, hey, we're doing zero trust. And so they come to us and they say, well, what is zero trust and how can I do it? And so I think it's incredibly critical to have those conversations so that we that may not be CISOs but still have to report to them or have to, you know, have these intelligent conversations and arm them to go to their board and talk about what zero trust is or why or why not we can do it. Um, I, I think the education part is, is extremely important and then relating it back to all of the different things that you guys were talking about, which is really at the end of the day what we're trying to do. So not ignoring the conversation and, and definitely, and not that you were saying that, but, but really talking about it, but relating it back to really what that data is, what our identities are, what our different processes are and how we can so, make it work. So for risk of maybe a repetitious answer, and just to stop Ralph from trying to add on a fourth time. <laughs> so in Q4 of 2018, Forrester released their wave to zero trust vendor evaluation. I think there was 14 vendors listed in the ecosystem providers paper. You know, if you just Google searched zero trust, I think you'd find another dozen vendors that weren't in the paper but claimed zero trust. Give, again, no disrespect to the solution providers and vendors in the space, but give those here listening some practical advice around how to navigate that what it's is it a how do i choose where do i go give them some if you you know give them some advice around where to start um well i think most of those vendors are uh like next gen firewall type vendors and and other types of vendors outside of the identity <coughs> space in in the report they had some you know up and comers or different things i think like Octo was one of those. It wasn't, I don't think it was like a fully evaluated solution, if I'm remembering that paper correctly, which is entirely possible that I'm not. But, um, you know, I think the identity vendors and, and even to some extent the data vendors pretty are, are, are pretty absent. <laughs> and so I, I think it's really just understanding what that report is trying to say or reports like that, the different types of products that it's really evaluating. Is it focusing on micro segmentation? Is it focusing on on, you know, firewall capabilities and packet um, evaluation and things like that? Or is it <laughs> focusing on some kind of broader picture of security and really why people are doing the things that they're doing? And I think that's what's kind of missing a little bit from that. And so um, I think that maybe that would help with some of the evaluation. I, I think you're spot on. I mean, there's so many of your next-gen firewalls that are conversations that are taking place around the micro-segmentation. Um, I think there was one identity vendor, Centrify, was in that, was in that list. That's a, they've been talking zero trust for a couple of years now. Um, but it's, it's still very, very, very scaled back to, to what the Palo Altos and, the, and some of the other you know, firewall companies are doing. Um, it, it's unfortunate, because, but I think that I think some of the more of the identity vendors need to be a, a much bigger play of that. I think that they would integrate more, though, right, the identity yeah. players? Because exactly. at the end of the day, the identity is already getting you to least privileged. Right, we're already controlling some of that access. And so really what you're looking at is the need to, for the micro segmentation. And then the other play is really around orchestration and automation. So those are the vendors that are really talking about yep. network layer, orchestration, automation. Uh, the identity folks, they're, like I said, they're doing it. They're getting the least privilege, separation of duties. They're doing their attestation. So they're, they're helping govern that identity. Now it's around putting controls around the data. It's like he read my next question. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so you mentioned a few more things, and they're like least privilege or sore. You know, there are other frameworks out there. So I have customers who ask me, like, should I do Zero Trust or should I do Carta? Just trying to give Gartner a nod since we've talked to Forrester <laughs> th this entire time. Um, I, is there anything specific from an advice perspective you'd be given to folks? Is there really a difference between frameworks? Is one better than the other? Or is it really just about the concepts and principles that may, may apply to them more? So I'll start. I, I think it, 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 and 
from my perspective, the zero trust is, is as I said already, programmatic, right? It's a big, it's, it's a, it's a, it's not a framework, it's, it's a strategy, right? It's, it's a direction to go. It's, it's how do you get to a, a I don't want to say least privilege because never privilege, right? It's never, ne never trust, always verify, It all sounds right? so negative though, zero trust, no privilege. It does, it does, but it, but it goes down to at the bottom line of who's supposed to be doing this and when? You know, I, I, I have some strong beliefs around governance around a lot of this stuff. How does a governance tool get a part of, you know, a zero trust environment, regardless if it's um, a, a next-gen firewall or if it's, a, 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 I don't know, an identity-specific um, tool? Um, so I, I, I think that... <clears throat> I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> I'll pick you up. <laughs> so... <laughs> Wait, hey, he's fired from the next panel. <laughs> <laughs> it was all good until then. No. <laughs> so, Zero Trust talked a lot more about the perimeter. Carta is the strategy, right, that, that Gartner has coined. That's their, their strategic, come on, let us come on site. We'll, we'll help you build that strategy to, to really get there. And, you know, I think Opta's approach is really taking that holistic approach as well. But we also want to appreciate the quick wins along the journey so that you don't lose the momentum of getting there. Because as Jerry mentioned, you know, when you hear 18 months, it's like mic drop, it's over. Nobody wants to spend that long to get to a win. But if you can build that strategy so that maybe you are starting with your next gen firewall, but you're eventually maturing and growing your strategy to evaluate and continue to get more quick wins, but also reducing your risk in your landscape, that's, that's the strategy that, that you really should be after, is what are those quick achievable wins to start reducing risk, but then also, what's your full end goal? What is that 18 month mark that you're, you're really striving for at the end of the year? You know, how are you gonna measure success of, did you reduce the risk? How did you accomplish that? And how much further do you still need to go? I think CARTA is actually also part of the maturity scale as well, or something like CARTA. So it's all about, it's in the name, like continuous um, assessment, right, to, to truncate it, because I can't remember all the letters. I know it's trust assessment, but... Adaptive risk but, and trust. Yeah, thank yeah. you. But it's, it's all about continuously figuring out what you're doing, where you have gaps, where you should be focusing. And so... I, you know, when we talk about the maturity of organizations when it's relating to security or identity or data, um, you know, governance and protection, part of that scale and really more on the mature end is continuously examining what you're doing. Is it really risk-based? Is it appropriate for what your business is trying to do? And so I think some of the elements that Carta has in play, that continuous examination and assessment, self-assessment as well as using organizations like Gartner to assess for you or with you is, is definitely just part of what you should be doing holistically as you continue to become more and more mature. Yeah, I mean, cybersecurity is a journey, and that journey is never going to end, right? We talk about zero trust, but like, to your point, that buzz term started, what, 10 years ago? So just because now that's finally coming to fruition, what's the buzz term that's going to happen this year that's going to take us 10 years to really evolve and, and develop that strategy? We're going to move to one trust. One trust. <laughs> um, so... In my opinion, an organization lives in sort of one of four cloud cultures, right? They're either cloud only, and there's probably a small percentage of the companies that are really cloud only. There's, you know, cloud first. They, they have new initiatives that sort of everything gets evaluated on. Is this cloud? Is this SaaS before I buy it? There's firmly hybrid, which I think most organizations live in. They have a little bit of footprint in both. And then, you know, there's a small percentage who are still cloud laggers. I, I won't ask anybody to show hands because the laggers are like, I ain't putting my hand up. But... Does their cloud culture impact their ability to be zero trust? Does it make it any easier or harder in any direction based on their consumption of cloud? Jerry wants to answer too. I, like, you know. I'll just, I want to, I'll give it to you in a second. But I, I think it's just about where your stuff is, where your data is, right? And so if you had bad stuff on, on prem and then you just. Stuff is a technical term for data. It is, you're, yeah. You're, you heard that at Identiverse, by the way. Right. You can if tweet you, that. If you have bad <laughs> That's stuff our and you just move it somewhere else, it's just bad stuff somewhere else. So I, I, I think you can absolutely do zero trust regardless of where your data is. You just have to examine your policies. I think everything that, that you know, that everybody else was saying up here and, and figuring out um, whether it's appropriate and for the type of data and the assets that you're protecting. 
guys can go ahead if you want. I was just going to say BOD definitely makes it harder. BYOD, sorry. Yeah, BYOD makes it harder. That's it. Does that bring your own drink? Yes. <laughs> Make it start new. Yeah. So no, I think, uh, so there are, there are, so I won't lose my train thought again, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> so there are certainly um, technology. So that kind of gets into the technology field. I first, I totally agree with Jino. It doesn't matter, right? It doesn't matter where, uh, whether you're in the cloud or you're 100% on, uh, on prem, right? Uh, that's fine. Uh, the technologies are going to help you support which direction to go. And to, to Ralph's point, the data. Where's your data, right? So you got you to gotta figure out where that data is. You've, you can implement your strategies to, to support regardless of where you are, whether you're in the cloud or not. Uh, so it, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think um, certain, certain vendors, and I'm not going to name any names, but certain vendors will tell you, yeah, we, we want you to go to the cloud because we can do it better in the cloud. Right, and then of course other vendors are like no, we're going to just do it in our little in our little firewall, and, and we're going to manage it there. So, does that answer your question? Sure. Sure. I forget my question at this point. <laughs> um, are there specific industry verticals that are more aggressively pursuing zero trust as a framework than others, and if so, why? Probably financial services, because a lot of the PCI regulations are already segmented in that piece of the network already. So I think you see it more in financial services, but. With the latest attacks, uh, wanting uh, people who have intellectual property, uh, they seem to be a new target for criminals, more so than HIPAA data uh, last year. Uh, the, the people who have IP now are really starting to take on this concept and this notion of you know where the asset is and how do I put more controls to the asset versus on my perimeter. I think the customer side of it is really driving the conversation a, a lot as well because the. The breaches are often, yes, trying to go after IP or yes, trying to go after PHI or something like that, but it's really, is that customer data or that that um, patient data or whatever it is. And so what we've seen, or at least I've seen historically, is that um, customer... Oh, sorry. Bless you. Wow, that was... <laughs> if you weren't awake, you are now. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, what we see historically is that the customer side of um, everything really for an organization is often extremely separated from your enterprise uh, security systems. And so we've kind of missed, we're not working together. We're not acting as a unified community between security and between the, the business teams that are running these different customer applications and systems and processes and all of that. And so I think that we see um, really it, it coming into play and uh, a lot more on the customer side as well. So zero trust then applies across all user classes in an organization. Absolutely. This is not an internal employee contractor framework for something different than for consumers. No, because you're really thinking about the data that you're trying to protect and how the different packets of that data are being shared across I like how the she just ecosystem. taps Ralph every time she and, says data. There must um, be some pain. I do. Oh, the data. <laughs> Well, I can't, can't make Ralph upset. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's all about the data. And so, you know, a lot of times we're like, okay, well, we have our employee and our contractor stuff, and we have our customer stuff. But you know, there I go with the stuff word again, sorry. But, um, you know, we're just trying to access the same application. So why do we have such disparate systems managing each of these different types of user communities? And it's really about breaking down some of those barriers and focusing on what's appropriate for what we're trying to protect. So I'm going to jump on your bandwagon for again for a minute, Ralph, um, because I'm in the identity and data practice, and I have to kind of play both sides of the field. I think it's one field, but I have to play both sides of that fence, right? Um, what is someone coming after? If someone's coming after something, they're coming after the data, IP, whatever it happens to be, PII data, right? If it's uh, GDPR, you know, I think all of that is where they're is where they're really going for, right? At the end of the day, that's that's where it is. Um, so, go ahead, Ralph. No, I'm just listen. I mean, I was just listening. To you, actually, hey, I think that was Jerry's second loss. <laughs> no, it wasn't. I just I, I knew Ralph wanted to say. I didn't something. know. Actually, Janelle brought up a couple of things that I thought about back to the original question about what makes it so hard, right? And we're talking about well, how do we talk to the business? How do we talk to the business? Zero trust is about really breaking down the barriers within IT as well. I have to talk to the storage team. I have to talk to the network team. I have to talk to the system admin. So I mean, the barriers within IT also, I think, prevent us from adopting it a little bit more. Folks. Does the size of one's organization impact their ability to pursue zero trust from a cost perspective? Like, is there, it's too big for this size organization, it's better for this size organization? 
I wouldn't say cost has anything to do with it. I think it has to do with when I meet with large companies versus small companies, you can have the same problems, but typically with the large companies, you've got your network or firewall guys kind of off in this office over here, and then your identity team may be in a completely different location across the nation. And so it's very easy to get very siloed into what your mission is for your team versus realizing that you're all on one team and, and that the end goal is to secure your entire infrastructure rather than just thinking of, of your siloed view. I see it with small companies too, where maybe it's a, a team of five guys and one's marching to the beat of his own drum while everyone else is maybe trying to accomplish a, a completely different goal. But if he's got you know the right leadership and the right say-so, he can be a completely different decision maker for shelfware that I see bought and you know I meet with companies that have two MFA products, two SSO products, and they don't even realize it because the two teams haven't talked. So, I mean, I, I think that siloing happens, big or small. I, I do think it's more prevalent in the larger companies, though, because it's just easier to, to run and hide and, and kind of be in your own world. It, I, sorry, go just, ahead. Just to add to that, right I think um, the smaller teams, often you're wearing multiple hats anyway, just inherently because you have a, a smaller team. Um, you have less people that are having to do the same amount of stuff. Um, so I, that, I, that was what I was going to add to that. But so if I go back to an earlier comment, right? I mean, if zero trust is made up of network, access control, security analytics, orchestration, data classification, et cetera, none of that typically in, in one organization is owned by one individual. So, so who are we seeing organizationally as the champions of these zero trust initiatives? Who, who on the client side of the organization is really driving these to, to execution? I, yeah. Yes. <laughs> I, I, normally, I, it's usually the security departments having the conversation or the networking team. Uh, it typically starts there, and it's a, asking them questions that they don't think about, right? They shiny object, the vendor says they solve it. What do you guys think about it? And versus taking a step back, what's the strategy for it? Uh, is it? Is it really fit for purpose? And then asking them simple questions like, what is the asset you're trying to protect? And that's usually where the zero trust conversation stops because they don't have classification policies or they do and they're not socialized or the business is not involved. So if I can't identify what the asset is, how am I gonna protect it? And I would say the people that I'm seeing at the table are changing. Um, because of GDPR, because now CCPA is coming out in January 2020, when I go to California, legal is driving some of the questions and saying, how, how can we make sure that we're compliant and we don't want to get fined? How do we make sure that our system is, is set up correctly and they have a seat at the table? You know, and, and that, I think, is changing. We see the same thing with the marketing um, folks being on the side when we're talking to consumers, uh, you know, a, a consumer identity conversation that marketing and customer experience is at the table making sure, yeah, we want to make sure that that data can be removed and that we're not oversharing our information with our customers. And so it's not just cyber or the, your security team anymore. It's there. We're finally realizing that everyone, it, it's a team sport, and no matter who you are in the organization, or you're the receptionist taking the people's badges and checking IDs before you let them on site to your, to your you know, um, location or whatever, everyone's playing a new part and a new role, and I think that that's a bigger challenge for us is it's not just the technology or installing the right you know, infrastructure and things like that. It's also making sure that everyone is aware as an end user of that, what your part is to play. If you're the receptionist, if you're this, if you're that, what are you doing to play your part in the security strategy overall for your enterprise? That's a good point. All right, so before I ask you guys for some fragmented final thoughts, <laughs> especially from Jerry. Are there, are there any questions out there, things that you guys want to hear discussed from a zero trust practitioner's perspective? Don't be shy. I'll run out with a mic. You guys could ask some questions. Come on, somebody's going to. Tim, you're going to ask a question, right? <laughs> mm. There we go. Can I borrow that? Thanks, Superman. Way to step up. Whoa. As I fall apart here. Thanks. Thank you. You touched a little on BYOD. Um, which is a debate that we're having internally at the moment on exactly how we address that. Could you talk a little bit more about what you're seeing from the industry and customers you speak to about how they're thinking about that? Because well, I think it's, you know, devices are everywhere 
And the reality is we all work from our phones anymore. No more eight to five jobs. You know, I was checking email last night on my phone at 11 o'clock. So the, the mobile, uh, you know, MDM solutions and, and really having that mobile conversation as well as being able to govern from a, d a device now is just a whole new challenge. I mean, we talk about the perimeter, but really the perimeter is pretty invisible at, at this point with, with those type of, of um, you know, capabilities now within our, just our phones or our tablets and things like that. We're constantly on, on a network somewhere doing something. And so there's a ton of different solutions, a ton of different ways, you know, to strategize that. I come from the identity side, so I look at it from that lens of how am I creating those permissions? What am I allowing to be installed from my infrastructure onto their phone to allow them access in and how can I best govern that and make sure that if something, you know, what data can be transferred to mobile devices and, and things and really looking at it from more of a policy and procedure standpoint. I think from, just to, to add to that, um, just recognizing that people are going to use all kinds of different devices, that they may be known, they may be unknown, and so how can we put in appropriate controls in place? If it's a known device, can we put a device cert on it? If it's a, you know, if it's a managed device, for example, if it's an unmanaged but known device, can we introduce, you know, MFA into utilizing, uh, you know, your login when you're coming in from that device? If it's a totally unknown device, like it's never been registered before, and you're trying to access internal systems, like as an employee or a contractor or somebody like that, then you know how can we examine what additional levels of controls? And then it's not just trying to get into the network, I think is the key with BYOD and really any of this when we're talking zero trust. It's what are you actually doing once you're inside as well? Because maybe you have the ability to authenticate. Maybe you, you're on an unknown device. You have authenticated somehow, maybe through a two-factor or not, but are you doing something that seems appropriate for the login that you're utilizing? Are you trying to go from, from one segment or one area of the network to another? And does it seem, is the behavior of that device you know, appropriate? Is the behavior of the login that they're using appropriate? And then is the movement of the data that they're, or if they're trying to move any of it, does that seem appropriate? So it's really just adding additional controls in place, just considering as one element the device that they're coming into it. So I don't think it's like a exactly, it's all, you have to have a very specific BYOD strategy. It's just incorporating how people can bring can utilize their own devices as part of your overall security picture. Another I'll question. I'll say this for you, Ralph, real oh. quick. Uh, one thing is, is I've heard a couple of times is governance, right? And, and, and really data and data governance and, and how that data is moving across on, the, on that device, as, as Janelle already stated, just to kind of highlight that point that the governance of those devices, governance of that data and how that's moving across that is really important. Yeah, I, don't, I think with the BYOD, it's, it's Again, it's the asset, right? How, how, how can I take the asset, my data off that device? Can I manage what data goes to that device? Can I validate that the person who's on the other end of the device is that identity? Uh, and then it's BYOD, bring your own laptop, bring whatever. Once I start controlling how that information gets used and consumed, I, I don't care where it's at. I can strip it off. Any other questions? There we go. Thank you. All right. Hands are flying. I love it. Don't be shy. Let's, let's see if we can stump them I'll, here and there, and then I'll go back there. Yeah, so as, as was covered today, zero trust sort of means that you don't trust just the peri you, If you're in the peri in your network, it doesn't mean you're, you're trusted, right? You, uh, you don't trust anything or anyone. Now, uh, how do you strike a balance? Say you uh, do MFA when you uh, log into your enterprise, right? Now, um, you do, and then maybe it's a privileged user and he wants to, that he or she wants to access something else. Again, is, is he asked for MFA again? Like, where do you draw a line, right? Uh, is SSO good enough uh, for zero trust? Yeah, it's, it's a fantastic question and it's all about risk. So what's the risk of what they're trying to access and how they're trying to do it and how they're trying to access it? So if you think about, and that's a, I'll bring it back to like what I was saying earlier around maturity, right? So if you, think, if you start with a two-factor authentication solution, that's great. It's better than not having anything, right? You're correct, uh, protecting 
adding additional layers of protection at least to your perimeter. But just like what you're saying, what do you do once you're inside of it? So if you go to a single sign-on page and you are trying to access Concur because you're trying to um, you know, make, a, make a travel request or whatever, maybe that's lower risk, right? But if you're trying to access SAP or whatever your other financial system is, maybe that's higher risk. And then you get down into what are you actually trying to do and well, I'll take a step back. Maybe you MFA going into SAP, but you don't MFA go, again going into Concur, just in this example. I'm not saying you have to MFA to go into SAP, but, um, but maybe what you're doing in this higher risk application or, or in this application that has some low risk things and some high risk things, maybe you figure out how do you protect um, the, the way that you're using the application. Do you have additional security controls of which MFA could be a part of based on how you're actually using the application itself. So you're already authenticated into the network, you're already authenticated into the application, whether it's through single sign-on or not. Maybe you've just typed your username and password into that app, but how are you actually using it? And I think that's where things like the next-gen firewalls with the layer seven app stuff, you know, where we're really figuring out how you're using the applications and those packets are being you know, transmitted and going yes. all over the ecosystem. So to, to Janelle's point, MFA doesn't have to be only at point of authentication. Right. Um, you know, there's integrations between MFA vendors and CASB vendors that if you're just out there doing stuff in cloud applications today, we, we may never ask you for a second factor, but you go to move a file from corporate box to your personal OneDrive or vice versa, now suddenly you're, you're asked for your second factor of authentication. It's really not authentication at that point, but they're asking for that same interaction to really prove that it's you beyond the initial authentication because you just did something that they think is, is great, of greater risk relative to the data. So I don't think it, it ever has to be binary. In fact, zero trust should mean it's layered purposely from that perspective. Well, and we've talked a lot about MFA and you brought up privilege access and you know that, that takes on a whole different strategy sometimes. I mean, when you're thinking of your contractors, great if they can authenticate in, but what are they doing with those credentials once they're in your system? And so that's where, you know, things like session management become a really important key part of that zero trust is I don't even trust that, that I know what you're doing with my credentials once I've given them to you to perform your task. So I'm going to watch you and make sure that we've got it recorded so that you know that there's accountability there for the actions that you're taking. I think that you run some risks when you start going down that conversation. If you tell your developers, I don't trust what you're doing, don't tell them that like that. <laughs> but, but you have to be able, the, the thing is, is that you have to make sure that you're using, I believe, positive <laughs> vernacular when you're talking about these things as an organization. Insider threat is a definite situation. And so we can utilize many of the same types of tools and controls and processes that Zero Trust talks about for insider threat programs, right? But session management isn't just about what are our, our developers doing now that they have these controls, not to pick on what you were saying, but it's about what if someone gets access to those controls as well? How are they utilizing, or con not controls, those uh, um, sets of credentials, right? You know, how are they utilizing that and, and how are we controlling how those credentials can be utilized? So I, I, think it's, I think it's a balance, right? We have to make sure that we're enabling our business to do the things that they need to do. We have to make sure to, uh, point, Dusty, that you made earlier, why peop, everyone in the organization has to know why security is important, right, and why these different tools are in place. But I think we can go about it from a, from a, from a somewhat of a positive yeah, <laughs> <as well. laughs> It's on here. Yeah. Okay, so that was very insightful and very enjoyable conversation. Thank you. So I wanted to actually take a different stance and ask this question. So it's always perceived that IT wants security and users want convenience. I vote convenience. I'm a working mom, and between all the lifestyles of the different accounts that we have, please no too much MFA for me. My patience is very less. So from a business perspective, right, so we can have these internal controls. You touched upon great points from compromised credentials, insider threats, and privileged access account mismanagement, right? All that is great. But when it comes into a consumer life cycle and we as user personas ourselves, how much of MFA is really too much? And what have you seen as a change appetite when you say, I pop you up now at login, I do it now when you try to get your file from the corporate box to your OneDrive. Hey, you're trying to go to Concur? 
oh, I might actually try you there. Or I go to SAP and try you there. So what has been your, in your experience, the change appetite, change tolerance, and what have been the challenges and how have you overcome that? That'd be helpful. Well, so I think maybe that's a two-part question. So the consumer side, you have seconds to capture your intention of your customer, right? So there is no appetite for a long registration process. So that progressive profiling over time and kind of getting to know each other over time to give you more access, but also build that relationship, maybe start, you know, understanding what device you typically log in from so that you're not having to MFA every single time. But it's also becoming this the norm. Every time I log into the bank, if I log in and I've cleared all of my caches on my phone, it's going to ask me again to verify and going to send me either some sort of, you know, uh, code that I have to type in, or uh, sometimes it even does it from voice, not not allowing me to use that same factor every single time. So I think culturally, it's shifting a little bit. We're getting used to some, because we understand that we want to protect our own data, we're starting to take it personal that you need to protect my data, but also not allowing it to become some. There is that balance between business enablement and user experience. And it's both sides of the coin, both on the consumer side as well as your internal workforce side of not making it overly cumbersome. We're seeing that more and more with the, the privilege access as well and making it super cumbersome feeling for our administrators to just be able to do what they used to be able to just log in and do. Um, so it's finding that balance of what is too much versus what's the evolution as they continue to step up up in your environment to more and more risk, uh, you know, uh, over time with those different applications that they're touching or the different um, data that they're trying to move around, that you're stepping it up and, and being really adaptive to what that user is trying to accomplish within your infrastructure. Oh, yeah. I'll just tell a couple stories since you asked also about our experience. Um, I, I would say... Uh, you know, I think we've all been in this game for a little while, right? And and so way back in the day, there was like these big sticks. So security had a big stick. If you didn't do whatever security wanted you to, they would shut your stuff off and, and they would make your life very, very difficult, right? Because we weren't appropriately balancing security versus business enablement like what Tussie was talking about. And then the business rebelled. Um, as anyone would, because we not, we're humans and we don't like being told what to do. And so then we got these massive IT sh or, uh, shadow IT issues, right? And so, okay, you're going to tell me that I have to follow your rules if I use your systems? Well, I'm just going to go out and buy my own system and do it however I want to do it, right? And then that introduced all kinds of new, new security issues and concerns and opened up you know, uh, potential new breach opportunities and things like that for us to exfiltrate data because we don't even know that the data exists. I cannot tell you how many conversations when, when we go in and we're doing an engagement and we're saying, hey, where does your data live? And they're like, well, we know this, but we don't know what we don't know, and we know that we don't know a lot. And so that's a really, really common conversation. And so now, just really in the last few years, I would say, the conversations that we're starting to have now with, with leadership, especially with our clients or that with, our, with my clients, that they're saying, OK, we recognize that we have to actually work with the business and figure out how they want to do things. And so now we're, try we're starting to see that balance come really back into play because they've completely lost control of their entire ecosystem because people are just doing whatever they want. Um, but on the flip side, since you mentioned like MFA, um, you know, I've had conversations where organizations still have to have the occasional big stick. And I think that that's OK. So I was um, working with an organization that has a lot of field agents. And there was this one person that ha uh, has, uh, was the number one salesperson for the entire company, bringing in an enormous amount of money. And they implemented MFA. And it was just at the perimeter. It wasn't like what we were talking about where maybe you have to multi-factor in you know, a bunch of different times, right? It was literally just at the perimeter. And this agent um, was extremely unhappy about this and got her son involved, who was like 20 years old and was going to school for security. And you know, he really knew that MFA was just not a thing that anyone did anymore. And, you know, he knew this. Oops, I just spilled water all over myself. But he knew this, right? And, um, you know, so he got involved. And, and the organization had to say, listen, we know that you're very special. And um, you want to be treated special. And you are special. 
but in this instance, you need to use MFA to get into the perimeter. And so they decided to not allow that exception because once they started making that exception, everyone was gonna want that exception. And so I think it's okay to treat people special sometimes, but also to draw a line in the sand and say, listen, we have to balance in this way today, but here's why, let me educate you. And what they did is they literally, they flew to, her lo to this person's location and uh, had like an hour long conversation with her, with the person and, and, and really let her, uh, explain to, to them why it was so important and how it wasn't really that bad of a thing. And you know, it really only adds like 30 seconds to your day and, and that kind of stuff. So. Well, that answer was quite special. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one more brief question. I think we have two minutes left in the total, in the three seconds. Okay, so your question has to be really brief and your answer, Janelle can not answer. Yeah. So uh, for the panel, do you think the uh, real-time AI technology will ever evolve to a point where the security department can implement zero trust while the business also delivers a zero friction consumer experience? I, I would just say I think it's already there. It's, the AI is not about the AI itself. It's more about how long you allow, how many consumption points of data you have how long you allow the data to marinate as you make better decisions. Uh, ML, AI, two more, bingo, buzzwords, you win. They're there today, it's more about how much data are you giving them and how long are you allowing it to profile develop around it. And, and, and there'll never be an only balance, like ML only unsupervised. There'll be some element of supervised all the time in almost every scenario. On that note, we're out, peeps. <laughs>